feels that way. So uh, as you might have seen, this meeting is going to be recorded. It's actually being recorded right now. And a copy of it will be shared on the city's Get Involved webpage, which you can access after tonight's session. That is at getinvolved.london.ca slash mobility master plan. You can also email mmp at london.ca with any questions, with any follow-up. Um, and also if you're having trouble accessing that recording, um, you can definitely let them know at that email. That contact information is going to be shown on a slide um, throughout this presentation, uh, or at the end of this presentation. And so um, many of you have probably realized that this webinar experience of Zoom is a little bit different. Those of you who are participants in this meeting, you can't see yourselves. Um, you can only see the panelists and the hosts on here. Uh, there also is not a, an ability to chat. However, you can definitely stay in contact with us through the Q&A icon, which you will see just at the bottom um, of, the, um, of the meeting. Uh, that Please feel free to use that function to ask questions as they come up during the presentation. We do have a dedicated person behind the scenes who is taking note of all of your questions and will be forwarding them to me to bring to our panel of experts, which I will introduce in just a moment, and we will speak to them at the end of the presentation. So any questions that come up, please send them in the Q&A, through using the Q&A chat, and we will do our best to get all of the answers um, to all of your questions. I also want to say that we are, um, I want to joyfully say that we are joined by two ASL interpreters um, that will be with us for the duration of this presentation. So welcome to Anissa and Heather. Thank you very much for being here. And if you want to turn on closed captions, which will allow you to read what is being said, you can do so at the bottom of the screen. Again, just hit um, the live transcript icon, which is at the far right. So, like I mentioned, any questions, please use the Q&A feature. We've disabled the chat so that people can stay focused and the presentation can come across very streamlined. Um, and also, if you, want to have a, if you want to ask a question, but you do not want to ask it during the presentation or in um, the Q&A box, mm -hmm. you can definitely email us to mm. You can send an email, excuse me, to mmp at london.ca. You also have the option to ask a question anonymously. Uh, so just for your information. And we will keep all questions, regardless of whether or not you submit them anonymously, we will keep all questions anonymous. So no fear. Um, so that's that. Uh, so going on to some agreements and some expectations at the top of this, uh, you have the choice to ask anonymously. Everybody's voice and everybody's question is valued and valuable. We're here to learn from each other. And also, this space is meant to be accessible to you. It's a space for you to take ownership and participate, ask questions, um, and engage. Also, just want to say, I'm sure that nobody needs to be reminded of this, but um, it should be said that everybody's opinions, everybody's input, and everybody's presence is valuable. So make sure that you respect your peers, um, also respect yourself in the space. Remember that we are in a collective environment. Our experiences are different, but they're also shared. So the real purpose of this space is just to have a, a conversation between community, to feel community, and to engage and learn from one another. Uh, remember to use I statements. Speak on behalf of your experience. Don't speak on behalf of others. Again, just going back to that piece of respecting oneself and, and one another's opinions. And um, just to give you an idea, we have, uh, towards the end of the presentation, like I mentioned, we have a very esteemed um, table of experts who will be speaking to us, answering your questions, 
and delving into what goes on in this presentation to kind of make it more um, integrated and to show you why mobility really matters across so many different sectors and how it affects all these different sectors uh, in the city of London. So we have the Director of Transportation Mobility joining us, the Director of Climate Change, a landscape architect, um, a representative from the London Transit Commission, uh, professional, a professional storyteller and producer, to just name only a few. Um, and we will hear from them towards the end of the presentation. Uh, and so we're about to get started. Uh, what are the agenda and the objectives of today? What you can expect to get from today's live stream, now that we have all of that housekeeping out of the way, uh, is an exploration of what is mobility? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the city? And what are the different ways that we can look at it and start to think about mobility in such a way that will take us to the next step? where London needs to be from where it currently is at. We also are going to share with you what is the Mobility Master Plan. And we have um, Sarah Grady, who will be leading that presentation. We're in very good hands. Uh, we want to talk about what is the future that Londoner, the future that Londoners want, a bit of a mouthful there, um, based on community conversations, that um, the committee working on the master plan has been holding for a number of months now. I, that's sort of what my representation is also on here. I am here to bridge between the presentation, the data, the statistics, the research that has been um, conducted for the last few years and uh, connect it with voices and people and faces from the community. So you will be hearing and learning some of that through tonight's presentation. Uh, we're also going to hear some feedback and where we currently are at with regards to the state of mobility in the city. We hear from the local context and, uh, like I said, a Q&A session with a large and esteemed panel, panel of experts and also how we're going to keep the conversation and some of the conclusions and takeaways going moving forward and implementing them. And. Um, one more thing to mention is that another important part of this is, is getting your feedback. So whether it's through your engagement with questions tonight or any follow-up that you send to um, our contact email, it's really important for us to hear and to encourage you to say that we want to hear from you. We want to hear your feedback um, and discuss how we can make moving around the city a more seamless, enjoyable and, um, you know, as great of an experience as it possibly can be for all Londoners. So that's a lot of talking. Now let's move into the start of this presentation. So to kick things off, I'm going to ask all of you to let us know in the chat, what does mobility mean to you? So please, um, whether this is something about physical mobility, being able to move, to walk around, to use your joints, you know, to use um, whether you are uh, moving around in a car, on a bike, uh, walking, in a wheelchair, however it is that you move around, what does this mean to you? So please, um, using the Q&A function, drop your replies in there. You know, sometimes mobility changes according to the seasons. In the winter, you know, does it, it also means cleared sidewalks and cleared roads versus in the summertime, you know, it seems like something that is a lot more easier to do and perhaps even take for granted. Um, are we able to, oh, awesome. I'm seeing some, some people answering. So the freedom to move around town without having to own a car that's mobility yeah i can certainly say that not being dependent on a car to get everywhere especially for the main trips i have to do school groceries right so being able to um, be free and move around in your city uh, or wherever you are living and have access to some of the basic things you need 
in order to live, access to food, access to your job, um, access to school. That's a great one. Being able to get around in different ways, depending on available devices, spaces, and facilities. I think that's a great one too. To me, that makes me think of um, weather, going back to the seasons changing again. Uh, mobility means that people can access places they need without a car safely. Okay, so I'm seeing some common denominators here. It seems we're a little bit car fatigued, <laughs> uh, which is understandable. Safe bike lanes. All right, excellent, excellent. I think we're, we're thinking in really great ways here. I feel like we got a bunch of um, environmentally thoughtful people in the room, which is always a lovely thing. Being able to move between neighborhoods in safe and enjoyable ways. Enjoyable, that's a really interesting answer, which I love. I would love to know what enjoyable means to all of you as well. Enjoyable mobility, right? Does that mean um, walking around or, or being you know, on a bike, for example, getting through the neighborhood, does that mean what you are seeing is also visually appealing? What is interesting? What is enjoyable in that sense? It's an interesting thing to think about. Having options. Sure. <laughs> sure. That is certainly uh, an important part of the definition of mobility. Mobility is moving people and goods safely using different modes of transportation, keeping in mind the use of sustainable transportation systems and climate change. Very thorough, very thorough. Sustainable transportation systems and climate change are certainly things that we're gonna be talking about in the presentation tonight. So um, I thank you very much for that answer and uh, look forward to when we start to touch on that topic in tonight's presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna read out a couple more here before we move on to the next point, um, which will kind of be integrating some of your answers. I believe mobility is a big issue regarding public transportation and getting riders to frequent around London, congestion, school. All right. Being able to move freely from place to place. Excellent. So of course we can see that there is uh, a lot of answers that are coming into this question. Many of you are saying the same things and I see a lot of concern and a lot of people bringing up sustainability, accessibility, equity, and being able to move around without a car, without a motor vehicle. So very interesting because, um, you know, typically, historically, as someone who grew up in London, uh, having a car was seen as a very essential way of getting around. So it's very, very cool to see Londoners talking about not owning a car as what, mob as what their definition of mobility is. Very interesting. Thank you so much to everyone um, for tuning in uh, to that question. So next, all of you answered what mobility means to you. We are going to get into what mobility means to uh, a very special person who is joining us tonight. Veronica Antipolo will share with you a story of what mobility means to her. So I'm going to let Veronica take it away. Hi everyone. Um, just to give you a big, bit of background, my name is Veronica Antipolo. I also go by Sassy Levy. I am a professional storyteller and um, I wrote this piece for this webinar. And the, the background behind this piece is uh, I was privy enough to see some of the feedback and I also see some of your feedback here. And I also come from a place of someone who has had to rely on other means of transportation, such as transit. I come from a place as a single mother who's had to rely on transit and who sometimes has had a car. Um, I come from a place of someone who is a working professional and my downtime is actually on transit, not driving, even riding a bike or walking. So I came from this place and it was easier for me to answer what mobility means to me by actually reversing the question and saying, you know, I have access to mobility. I have that privilege. But what if you flip it around and you say, okay, what if it was taken away? Then I felt 
what it really means to me. So um, here is my piece. It's 5.55 a.m. in downtown London. I feel like some invisible director has yelled action and I'm part of a bustling scene depicting mobility. As I wait to cross the street, people bus, walk, drive, and even scooter past me. Dressed business, casual, or somewhere in between, all heading to that place we each need to be. Some move fast because they're late and some move slower. But not all the slow ones are ahead of schedule. They're just already really late anyway. So what exactly is mobility, I wonder? And when I wonder, I must Google. I open up a new browser tab and the thin line of the cursor blinks in the popsicle stick shaped Google search bar. I type mobility meaning. Google replies, the ability to move or be moved freely and easily. But why should we care about mobility and how does it matter? Now, of course, mobility via whatever mode we use gets us to where we need to go, but it also brings us home. And home isn't just the structure or the place that we flip, that we physically live in. It's more, isn't it? Home is a feeling. It's a feeling like we're connected, feeling like I'm included and feeling like I'm safe because London is home. And if you help me move about with ease, I can meet people and create community. I can contribute. I can learn. I can appreciate. I can explore. I can protect our environment and our future because London is home. If you help me move about safely, I won't be in shadows. I'll be in light. I won't feel fear. I'll feel comfortable. I won't be alone and isolated. I'll be out and about. I won't feel ignored. I'll feel welcome because London is home and home matters. So mobility is key. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank wow. You. That was, um, that was powerful and a very powerful way to get this, this um, presentation started. So thank you. We're gonna hear more from what inspired Veronica's piece there towards the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Next up, I am super thrilled to introduce Sarah Grady, the project manager for the Mobility Master Plan and the Traffics and Transport Engineer at the City of London. So Sarah knows everything there is to know about the mobility master plan in London, and she's going to share with us what the city is defining as mobility for the purposes of this project, and also take us through the majority of the presentation and sort of demystify what mobility and the future of mobility in London looks like from a policy level. So Sarah, please take it away. Thanks. Um, really excited to, to be here to chat with everyone. Those are two really great speakers, to um, tough acts to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, we are very excited to chat with everyone today um, about this very exciting project. So we'll, we'll jump right into it. So we obviously just heard a lot about uh, mobility needs to um, a lot of people that are on the call, which is really great to hear. Um, the London Plan also has a definition of mobility. Um, if you're not aware what the London Plan is, it's a council approved policy planning document. So it sets out our long range plan and vision for the city. So things like where we develop, how we develop, opportunities we provide people with respect to access to recreation and nature and things like that. The London Plan makes a very explicit connection with between land use and mobility. Um, so throughout this, uh, this webinar, you'll see a number of London plan policies referenced throughout. Um, part of the goal of the mobility master plan is to deliver on those visions and policies set out in the London plan. 
So the London plan definition of mobility is what's up on the screen here. It's the movement of people and goods through and beyond the city from one location to another in a safe, accessible, convenient, and affordable manner. So hopefully that resonates with people. I think a lot of the feedback we did get um, through people um, on the Q&A was, was in line with that. Um, and there's certainly uh, you know, a lot of different uh, definitions of mobility out there and it means different things to a lot of different people. Um, really in other words, mobility is the freedom to get where you need to go. It's being able to access your everyday needs um, and it considers all the different ways we move around. So what is the mobility master plan? Um, I mean, it's important to, to think about how much space we dedicate in the city to moving around. Uh, we move around using our streets and our multi-use paths. What we're doing as part of this project is we're planning how we're gonna build and improve those from now until 2050. We prepared or put together a, a draft vision state for the statement for this project. Um, it really proposes the vision of what we wanna achieve um, the vision hasn't been finalized yet because we wanted to hear from, from you, the community first to confirm if this was in line, what, what people wanna see, what, what vision you see for the future for London. So our draft vision statement for this plan is that by 2050, Londoners of all identities, abilities and means will have viable mobility options to allow them to move through safely city, sorry, through the, throughout the city safely and efficiently. The movement of goods and people will be environmentally sustainable, affordable, and supportive of economic growth and development. So in other words, safer, easier, faster, cheaper, greater. Our draft vision is it's primarily about choice. Um, as the city grows, we need to give Londoners more diverse forms of mobility and, and give them the options that they deserve and the freedom that they deserve to choose how they're gonna move throughout the city. So these are the guiding principles. So similar to the vision, um, they haven't been finalized yet. So we'll be finalizing them once um, you know, we, we get more feedback from the community. And what they're going to do is help inform how we develop and evaluate options for how we, we're gonna achieve that vision that we talked about. So our, our guiding principles for this project are to be environmentally sustainable. So taking bold action to address climate change and design and move in ways that protect and enhance the natural environment. It's also to be financially sustainable, ensuring mobility and its infrastructure is affordable for current and future generations. It's also important for us to be equitable, recognizing diverse mobility needs and embedding equity into decision-making to enable everybody to move throughout the city. We need to be healthy and safe. So promoting and protecting the physical, mental, and social well-being of all and encouraging active living. And we need a mobility system that's integrated, connected, and efficient. So strengthening the community uh, and the economy with better access to people, places, goods, and the services as London grows. Okay, so now we'll move into the next section. Uh, we're gonna go over a lot of what we've heard from the community about transportation and mobility in our city. Um, and we'll let you know where we're at um, in, in building that sustainable mobility system. So just to kind of go over, um, where we're getting all this, this feedback that we're kind of gonna be going over and sharing with you today. Um, we've been uh, working on a research period that's been going on since uh, April of earlier this year, um, and it's gonna continue into to winter 2023. So the purpose of this research and, 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 and outreach is to understand the experience of Londoners as they move around, because we all have different experiences. Um, and that feedback's gonna be used to develop an action plan um, based on that user experience in order to enhance mobility services in the city. So we got this feedback and data through informal conversations, focus groups, emails, uh, surveys provided online and in person. The surveys collected um, demographic information, which was provided per by participants on a voluntary basis um, and open-ended questions for participants to fill out. Our project team has been having bi-weekly meetings with the community connectors, um, 
to reach out, discuss feedback as it's collected and identify emerging trends and patterns. Okay, so let's let's dive right into it. So um, first off, we heard a lot about sidewalks and lack of them in some areas of the city. Sidewalks play a crucial role in making our communities more walkable. They encourage residents to be more active outside their home and provide connections to parks, trails, transit, grocery stores, medical centers, jobs, and, and various other everyday needs. Without accessible sidewalks, um, many are limited in how far they can travel or, or in what they can access. So the London plan policy is that all streets should have sidewalks on both sides of the road, with very few exceptions. And that's how we're doing all our new community building. That's how we're building all new neighborhoods. Um, however, there are many existing neighborhoods with limited sidewalks, in particular, the ones built in the 1950s to 1970s, 1980s. Sidewalks in that era, um, sorry, streets in that era were built with a focus on cars, res resulting in fewer sidewalks. So sidewalks are being, being constructed in those communities that could, don't currently have them um, through local road reconstruction projects, infrastructure life cycle renew project, projects, and through the new sidewalk program, which is a community request based process. So how are we doing? Um, looking back at about a five year period, we built about 15 kilometers of new sidewalk a year. Based on that rate, uh, and with over 400 kilometers of, of roads right now that have no sidewalk, it's going to take approximately 30 years, about $80 million to get a sidewalk on one side of every street. Now that's a big number, um, just to put it in context, that's an estimated value if we were gonna put um, sidewalks on a street and that was the only activity going on. When we do it as part of larger construction projects, there's, there's a cost savings that, that goes into that as well. To, to sum up, to sum it up, really, um, what we're hearing is um, that sidewalks are very important to people, and, and while we are making progress, um, it's not fast enough. We've also heard a lot about the conditions of the sidewalks in the city. Even in good weather conditions, uneven sidewalks has, have come through as a real issue for many. We've heard things like curb ramps being too steep or too uneven and people with mobility devices getting stuck or being fearful of tipping over even. We've heard about response times to complete sidewalk repairs and how difficult it is for people in the meantime to navigate sidewalks that are cracked or uneven, especially when you're on, when you're on wheels. Currently in the city, about 2% of the sidewalks are considered to be in poor to poor, very poor condition. Okay, 2%, that actually is about 30 kilometers of sidewalk. We've also heard things about sidewalks being narrow and it being challenging when it's being shared between people walking and people riding bikes. We also hear a lot about, you know, how much more challenging it is to move around on sidewalks in the winter. Um, we've heard from people whose scooters have gotten stuck in the snow um, and they haven't been able to move on the sidewalks. We've heard things about how isolating the winter can be for some. Some simply cannot leave their home when it snows. We've heard about struggles to access bus stops through piled up snow and about people who've gotten stuck in it and, and have had to wait three hours for police to arrive and help them. In addition to our recent conversations with the community through the mobility master plan, um, we've also had a lot of uh, feedback through the uh, multi-year accessibility plan. Uh, and we see your comments every year on social media, media when, when the snow starts to fall as well. Some of our standards are listed up on the screen here, um, but we know that you know 48 hours to, to clear snow is a big deal. For some people that means they're not leaving their house for two days to go ask, access the things they need. Uh, City Road Operations did do a review of winter maintenance programs and support options a few years ago, which outlined some options to, to improve these standards. Um, one of the things we really want to do as part of this project is, is put together a compelling case for why we need to implement these improved winter maintenance standards and really highlight how these winter maintenance standards not only impact how people choose to move around the city, but if they can at all. Another one of our goals is, of the London plan is to create a continuously linked cycling network throughout the city. Something we've heard from a lot of people is that they want to bike more, but they feel unsafe, unsafe doing so. And we're aware of a strong desire for more separation between people on bikes and automobiles. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have about 35 kilometers of protected and, and involved bike lanes. 
these bike facilities have physical separations between the bike lane and traffic. So that's usually a concrete curb, um, or sometimes it's um, you know a, a, a physical separation um, along the painted line, but it doesn't include just painted bike lines. It's just a, a pavement marking on the road. We also have plans to implement 35 more kilometers of protected bike lanes over the next five years. So we're making progress and, and we're seeing more riders because of it. Um, our core cycling network has been 50% uh, year over year growth with an average of 600 riders a day riding on Colburn and Dundas, for example, in recent months. So although we've made progress in re recent years, we're keenly aware of the cycling network and, and how it's disconnected and has some important gaps to fill. Um, the map on the left there um, shows the protected bike lanes in red. So you can see how disconnected they are and, and the gaps that are between them. Um, currently only 23% of people are within 500 meters of a protected bike lane. Our goal is to make that 100%. Also, to better understand our cycling network, uh, we're, gonna, we're working on an assessment of all the various types of cycling facilities and rating them on a stress level one, two, three, or four. Um, that's based on a variety of criteria, such as the speed and volume of traffic, um, whether there's a physical separation or not, um, things like that. So it'll help us gain a better understanding of our all ages and abilities network as a whole and, and really help us highlight where the needs and priorities are. We should also note that we have 45 kilometers of the main spine of the Thames Valley Parkway, along with 140 kilometers of secondary pathways, which is also continuing to grow based on the 2016 cycling master plan. The pathway system is important, recreational, and, and provides mobility connections for people walking and cycling. Uh, we have heard desires for, for better winter maintenance uh, along the, the Thames Valley Parkway. Um, and as part of the mobility master plan, we'll be providing a holistic cycling and walking network uh, that includes pathways and on-street components. And we'll be looking at those winter, winter maintenance standards as well. So to summarize, we've heard a strong desire for more protected uh, bike lanes and to make the, the cycling net, like, network more connected. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so hope all of you were paying attention and taking in that information. We are, there we go. We are now going to sort of integrate this with a question. So you see the question on the screen there. It is, do you bike in London? Uh, yes or no? And first, if you could answer that question and then um, we'll, we'll keep this moving. We'll talk a little bit. Let's talk. Do you bike? Um, yes or no? And so if yes, I want you to type in the chat in the Q&A function, excuse me. Uh, what are your biggest challenges? Is it we've uh, we've been seeing some people ask about bike lanes, um, been seeing people ask about uh, bike lanes in addition to sidewalks. So let us know what's what's your biggest challenge when it comes to biking and is where you bike the decisions on where and when you choose to bike to places limited by how comfortable you feel, how safe you feel while biking on the streets. Um, let us know in the chat. And uh, bike parking. OK, somebody is saying that bike parking is also another thing that they think about. That's great to know if you selected no. If the city had a more connected and protected bike network, this is a follow-up question, would you be more willing to cycle around the city? So if your answer to that question was no, is it because there isn't enough opportunities for you to feel comfortable while cycling? Let us know. And if we could also uh, share the results of the poll with, with uh, the presentation, that would be great. There we go. So, Wow, 72%, that's 33 people said yes, they bike around the city, and 28% said no. So that is, um, that's a very pleasant surprise for me personally. Uh, let us know in the chat if, uh, okay, let's see, why are people, why do people, um, construction impedes my abilities. Interesting, that's, that's right, we know uh, summer, Time can also be construction season, 
That's the other um, <laughs> alibi of summer. Yes, you bike, but only for pleasure. You don't feel safe biking to work. You can't bike to the grocery store because there's no dedicated lanes. Uh, can't bike with your daughter. And you can't bike to work because you have to cross a major road and that feels dangerous. All right, so um, the need for some more safer bike lanes. I bike to Western universities from Oxford and Richmond and the lanes feel extremely unsafe. So you bike on the sidewalk. Okay, and the lanes end abruptly. You love biking, but you want your kids to feel comfortable. Uh, so, okay, a lot of feedback coming in. And it seems that many people are concerned with comfort and safety and the extension of the bike roads. So this is excellent to know. Thank you so much for your, your feedback here. Um, this is the place to be having these conversations. You have the eyes and ears of some very influential and important people on these topics. So please keep keep this engagement and conversation going. Once again, we'll have a chance to hear from um, experts across the field of mobility in London towards the end of the presentation. So again, with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Sarah, who will take over and continue to talk about transit. So Sarah, back to you. Thanks, Sarah. And I'll just echo what you said there, just how important this feedback is. It really does you know, feed into to how we prioritize um, and, and plan our improvements within the city. So. The more feedback, the better. So we'll move on to transit here. Um, transit was actually one of our biggest topics of uh, discussion. We, we probably heard more about transit than anything else um, in the last few months. Um, our partners um, at LTC have been with us during the feedback every step of the way as well. And Katie Burns is here with us tonight. I will take you through some of the feedback we've heard about transit and some of the information about how the current transit system is um, evolving. And for those of you new to London, I guess um, I'll start out by explaining that there's um, three tiers to our, to our transit system. So uh, there's rapid or high order transit, we have express routes and then local routes. So let's start with the rapid transit. The city is currently building three major infrastructure projects that will bring rapid transit to key corridors of London. Uh, these rapid transit buses will travel along these corridors and transit only lanes, providing increased frequency and reliability. It will op be operated by LTC as part of the existing public system, and it will be the same fare. Going back to the London plan, uh, rapid transit is uh, a core component of achieving that vision of the London plan. Um, so as part of this project, we're going to be looking at high rate of transit planning um, from now all the way up to 2050. Another thing we've heard a lot about is frequency and wait times um, and the length of bus transfers, which currently are 90 minutes. Uh, we've heard a lot about the hours of operation and a desire for, for transit in areas that don't currently have it. Um, when we do talk about transit, I think it is important to, to acknowledge that um, while LTC has annual service improvement plans, um, which are equivalent to adding about um, 18,000 additional service hours, they actually have unfortunately been able to implement uh, the approved 2021 and 2022 plans um, due to challenges with hiring operators and, and bus supply chain, supply chain issues. Um, despite that, um, in, in prior to those years, LTC did implement five express routes in the last 10 years. And as part of the 2021 service plan, um, another will be implemented. We have heard that people like the express routes. Um, we've heard several comments about wait times um, and cross town trips taking too long without them. So the, those express routes really do um, make that travel time faster. Also as part of the 2021 service plan, uh, once LTC is able to implement it, um, there will be a reduced max scheduled wait time from 60 minutes to about 30 to 40 minutes. So that alone um, is equivalent to about 15,000 additional service hours, just to put it into context. As part of future plans, there's also ambitions to improve the frequency of the 20 local routes that uh, intersect with rapid transit. So, so the goal and the plan there is to make it so those local routes come at least as frequent as every other rapid transit bus. Other things that are gonna be considered as part of future service plans, um, and, and we, we do hear a lot of comments about it, is, is looking at starting routes, most routes an hour earlier, 
that's about 24,000 additional service hours. Um, another thing that will be looked at and, and is continued looked at is um, adding weekday transit routes to new subdivisions. Um, doing that for just weekday routes um, at about a 30 minute frequency is equivalent to 9,000 service hours. So um, we're always, we do hear the feedback and we wanna keep hearing the feedback and, and figure out how we can put a plan together to meet those needs. Um, some recent wins for the London Transit system, and despite the fact, you know, we have been able to implement those last two service plans, um, LTC was uh, approved for separate funding to implement um, an alternative service delivery model, which is a non-traditional approach to acquire and, and deliver transit services. Um, that model is planned um, to go to Innovation Park. Um, so that's a, that's a great thing there that we're really excited about. It will take a little bit of time to implement because um, we LTC needs to get the software because it's a pre-booking system. Um, and then they need to get a provider to actually provide those transit services, which will likely be contracted out. Council has also approved separate funding for LTC to get 10 electric buses. Um, and LTC is working with the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium um, to explore upper level government funding programs to help get more as well. Similar to the alternative service delivery model, it will take some time to get those buses on the road, um, but it is in progress. We're also happy to report that post-COVID ridership is back up to about 90% on the weekdays and on weekends it's actually up to uh, about 110%. However, it does further um, make riders feel the effects of you know, not having the 2021 and 2022 service plans um, in place yet. There are uh, many other things or uh, other things we've heard about transit. Uh, we just don't have time to touch on all of them as part of this presentation, but some of the other things we've heard about include uh, requests for bus stops and benches um, and questions and comments about how to access up-to-date information about when buses will arrive, bus detours, temporary stops, things like that. We will be posting on the project's Get Involved website more information on, on some of those. Okay, so accessible transportation. Um, both through the community engagement for this project, as well as through the development of the, the multi-year accessibility plan, we've heard a lot about some of the challenges and barriers faced by those who use accessible transportation. So in London, we have paratransit services, which costs about $3, the same as local transit. Um, unfortunately, we have limited paratransit operators right now. Um, some of the same challenges that we've had facing uh, with the, the implementing the, the service plans as previously mentioned. Um, and with paratransit, those medical trips are prioritized. So all other trips need to be booked three days in advance. This really does impact people's ability to make spontaneous decisions, to be able to meet their everyday needs without constantly having to plan everything in advance. We do also have accessible cabs in London, which are an option for some. Uh, they charge standard cab rates. Currently in London, we only have about 16 accessible cabs down from about 30 pre-pandemic. This is not nearly enough to meet the needs of Londoners. Residents never know if they can count on an accessible cab to be available when they need it. And as a result, it's impacting where they choose to go, what they can access and really their quality of life. The shortage of both paratransit and accessible cabs is a real issue for some. Um, we actually heard from a mother whose child got sick at school and needed to go home and there's no paratransit or accessible cabs available. So the mother had to get a cab, go all the way to school, get her daughter and then cab home with her on her lap. Life can be tough enough um, when a child or loved one gets sick and we really need to make being able to move around within London easier and not an extra stress to have to deal with. Accessible transportation becomes incredibly important as we work towards supporting our aging population and Londoners with visible and non-visible disabilities. One thing that we will be assessing um, is a potential for an alternative service delivery model. Um, that's something that, that Londoners want, need, and deserve. Um, and, and I guess I'll just touch on one of the other quotes on, on the screen here too. Um, a lot of the, the LTC buses are, are accessible and, and some people can take those one place, but then they want to be able to take an accessible cab home in the dark. So again, like having a shortage of those really impacts a lot of people that even take the, the bus regularly. Um, again, it's the whole part of this plan is really providing with people with options and, and that's kind of sums up some of the challenges people are currently dealing with from an accessible standpoint.
Thanks, Sarah. So um, to everybody who's listening right now, we just want to take a moment to reflect on what has been said, but also what has not been said regarding transit, mobility, and accessibility. So this is just a moment to just reflect on this point that many Londoners rely on transit to get around. Public transit is their only way of moving around. As Sarah mentioned, it really isn't always feasible uh, to be taking a cab everywhere. Um, sometimes we need to rely on public transportation to get from place to place. And for a lot of Londoners, that's not a choice. Um, it is a requirement. So just want to take a moment and think about that. Um, also think about the younger generations who are not so interested in car ownership. Many students who don't want to get a car, but also have reported through the research um, done by the committee that transit is one of the reasons that they want to move out of London after graduation because it's not as reliable a system as they would like. We also heard from minimum wage workers and youth um, that pay for a lot of Ubers because they cannot rely on transit and there's a shortage of taxi cabs in the city. Uh, so again, whether where you are at socioeconomically, generationally, um, or even geographically in the city, transit is not always an option um, for you to take, but you need more options because it is your only option. Sarah, back to you. Thanks, Sarah. So we'll move on to road congestion. Uh, we did hear a lot about road congestion and, and travel time as well. Um, and there's really two ways we can better manage that. One is through road improvement projects. So for example, as many people may be aware, we're currently replacing the existing Adelaide rail crossing with a subway or a separated rail crossing, um, which means that this major arterial will no longer be plagued with delays due to frequent trains. Um, this new crossing will also improve the movement of transit and emergency vehicles and reduce cut through in the, the neighboring areas. We're also soon planning to start construction on the replacement of the, uh, the rail bridge at Warncliffe between Horton and Stanley, which will also include widening that bridge as well. We recognize that we need to develop solutions that involve more than just widening our routes to improve cars though. Uh, we also need to look at ways that make our existing corridors more efficient. Uh, projects such as the new traffic management center, center and intelligent traffic signals are a couple of other initiatives um, that are going to help as well. So I mentioned there's kind of two different ways we can um, you know, manage road congestion. One is through those road improvement projects and, and optimizing signals. Um, another way we can do it is through transportation demand management or TDM programs. Um, these programs shift uh, private automobile use to other modes. Um, it disperses travel times from peak demand or eliminate the need to travel altogether. TDM can reduce the demand for new or wider road infrastructure by persuading Londoners to drive less often uh, to closer destinations, outside of rush hours or, or using less busy routes. This is much less expensive than building and maintaining roads. Examples of TDM programs include facilitating carpooling, um, incentives to walk, bike or transit, um, and disincentives to drive alone, such as parking management. Based on the 2016 household travel survey, uh, we know that about 11% of daily trips at that time were taken by walking about 1% bike, 8% transit, and 77% automobile, broken down by um, driving alone and carpooling. Now, what's also interesting is that the average in-town trip is only 4.8 kilometers. That's about a 15 to 20 minute bike ride. Um, and also a third of the, the total trips are actually less than two kilometers. So that's about a 20 to 25 minute walk. So there really is a real opportunity for people to, to choose to walk or bike um, to access their everyday needs if those, you know, that infrastructure is there for them to use and do that safely. Um, and we know that there's an interest in it too. Based on that same survey, we know that about a quarter of people would consider leaving their car at home and moving around the city in a different way. 
And, you know, based on a lot of feedback we, we've received through this project, I, I feel pretty confident that number is actually higher now um, than it was at the time of that 2016 survey. We also know based on that survey that at that time, about 29% of people would consider switching from driving to carpooling, which also is a, a great thing. With reduced reliance on personal vehicles, our community will see a cleaner, cleaner air um, le leading to direct improvements in public health. TDM initiatives that support increased levels of walking and cycling also enhance overall quality of life and more. Another TDM strategy is eliminating the need for travel altogether. So for example, based on SATS Canada, um, about 40% of jobs could theoretically be done from home. In 2015, about 6% of Canadians usually work from home. In January, 2021, during the pandemic, about 32% of people worked from home. So there's a real opportunity um, to, to leverage that. Um, and we also want to, on top of that, encourage employers, if you know if people are going into the office or, or, or need to go to their place of work, um, to make those hours more flexible, um, that can help minimize the number of trips that are taken during that peak time. So all these measures help manage road congestion. Um, it, you know, and, and it helps others that have to be on the road at those peak hours, um, and it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we can't also forget about um, the movement of goods. Um, not something that maybe people think about every day, um, but it is, it is crucial to everyday life. Um, it's a, important to the well-being of our economy and it makes it possible for people to be able um, to get their everyday needs. Um, and it provides for um, employment for residents as well. The map here on the screen shows in red the routes with the highest truck volumes. Uh, right now in the city, there's a high volume of trucks which access industrial areas in the south and the east of the city. Um, for example, truck volumes in the area of the new Maple Leaf processing facility in the south end as part of the city will, will increase um, once this facility opens. And we need to ensure that these roadways are designed um, to manage that increased volume. Through the mobility master plan, we need to consider um, planned development in the industrial areas and associated uh, commercial vehicle vehicle or heavy truck movements to ensure that the surrounding roads um, are capable of accommodating them. Um, and this also includes working with the province um, for plan improvements to, to the Highway 401 series, um, interchanges, and the city's road crossings. Uh, looking at the map, um, once goods, uh, as they come to and from those industrial areas, they also need to be distributed throughout the city to various stores and uh, local distributors, um, which is why you're seeing some heavy volumes on some of those arterial roads throughout the city as well. So travel to and from London. Um, as part of the mobility master plan, we're really focusing on how people move around within London, but it's also very important that we take into consideration how and where people are coming into and going out of the city. Um, in January, 2020, the province released a draft transportation plan for Southwestern Ontario titled Connecting the Southwest. It included creating a task force with representatives from Southwestern Ontario mayors and indigenous communities as a venue to discuss transportation service needs and opportunities to better integrate transportation services in the region. The task force chaired by the one and only Mayor Ed Holder has been working uh, to identify opportunities to make it easier for people to travel between communities and access services such as healthcare, education and employment. The task force has focused on improving connections between rail, bus and local transit services across Southwestern Ontario and ensuring that our plan is informed by local needs and considerations. Uh, some of the London specific recommendations include um, creating a downtown hub um, that would function as the primary inter-regional hub. Um, it would include rapid transit connections and also connections to the train station and rail connections. Secondary hubs uh, were also recommended to function for the larger areas around the city where local transit routes converge and where there are currently high levels of transit service. These hubs are also to serve as major connection points for inter-regional travel um, for people coming to and from London. 
The routes connecting to the primary and secondary hubs will provide the highest transit frequency and ridership in the city. And speaking of the, the transportation hubs, it's important that those hubs provide direct access to the city's greater transportation and mobility network, um, some of which I already touched on. Um, it's important because it, we need to make it easy for people to switch from traveling one way to another. Um, for example, the hubs are recommended to have pick up and drop off zones for taxis and shuttles. Um, they're recommended to have secure parking for bikes, both for short term and long term, um, and car share. Um, there are also ambitions to provide park and ride in the south end um, at the south end transportation hub. Um, that park and ride is currently in the process of confirming the facility requirements and the site selection process. At a minimum, the new terminal is, is planned to provide opportunities for park and ride um, and also platforms for our LTC buses. There's also um, you know, ambitions to include provisions for regional bus carriers, inter-community transit, um, and the ability to support alternative service delivery models for transit um, service to industrial areas to the south and east. So there's a lot of great ambitions and, and things are all in different phases of the planning, um, but it's not just about the transportation hubs. We need to make it easy for people to move from one mode of travel to another um, throughout the entire city. Um, for example, the city is piloting enclosed bike lockers at three locations downtown to help provide cyclists with a new secure space to park their bikes. LTC buses, regular buses are also all equipped with bike racks. Um, there are also many um, accesses um, to which connect to sidewalks and bike lanes and it's on streets with the, the Thames Valley Parkway. And of course, every bus trip starts and ends with a walk. So um, filling in those gaps in our sidewalk network as previously, dis previously discussed is also really gonna help that. Overall, overall, we have been hearing a lot of positive feedback from the community about the facilities that we have implemented and what the plans are, um, but we're, we're hearing that we need to do more and we need to do it faster. Um, so all the feedback we're getting from everyone is so important how in play we prioritize the investments. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Sarah. So I just want to take a moment and give a, a big ups to everybody who is tuned in right now, because it's really clear that everybody from all of your comments, you're very educated on mobility and mobility options in London, and you have such valuable things to say. So I just want to give thanks to the audience tonight, to the crowd. Um, so for those of you who are um, who are here, we're going to do another really quick poll. We're running um, just slightly behind on time because there's just so much information that we are very happy to share with you. So, um, but we do want to be able to get to the Q, to the Q&A at the end. So we're going to run through this poll very quickly. Um, and I'm going to read out just a couple of responses that come in, but um, what is your primary mode of transportation? We want to know. So you'll see the options there are, well, you can read them. I'm not going to um, read them out for you, but pick what is your primary mode of transportation. And um, those of you who answered uh, to whatever that your answer was, please write in the chat, why do you choose or why do you move around in these ways? And is it a choice or is it uh, something that you have to do? Um, it's important for us to understand what factors into the way that you move around the city. How much choice do you have? How much agency do you have? Or are you moving around and using transportation because you have to and you don't have other options? So please let us know in the chat um, what your mode of transportation is. If we can see um, what results have come in so far. Um, all right, someone said walking until it snows, then you take the bus. Um, I wish my answer could be something other than car, but living in a newer area on the outskirts of town, the other options are very limited. Yes, and um, we did see some comments about um, the um, interconnectivity being outside of downtown, living on sort of outskirts or suburban areas. And of course, we do see the majority of answers coming in are cars. It's almost half, which is interesting because at the beginning of the meeting um, today, over half of the speakers here or of the participants said that they bike. So really interesting. Glad that there are people who have options. But of course, um, everybody's 
mobility status is different and everybody's options for mobility is different. So thank you very much, um, again, just for being here, for your engagement. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to send it right back to Sarah um, so we can get through the rest of, of this. And then soon after, we'll be in the Q&A section. So Sarah, back to you. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll move on to road safety. I'll try and keep us moving here. Um, there is just so much we, we want to share with you, but uh, I'll, I'll try and keep us, get us back on track to, to get to the Q&A. Um, so road safety, um, we've heard a lot about road safety as well. Um, it's a very important topic and an area of concern for all of us, our road safety partners and the community. Um, we're actually part of the London Middlesex Road Safety Committee, along with the hospitals, uh, Middlesex County, London Police, EMS, the Health Unit, and the Ministry of Transportation, oh, and London Police, um, and others as well, who, who uh, who's just really, their mission is to help save lives and reduce serious injuries for all. Um, what well, we have seen a reduction in the number of serious collisions over the last number of years. Um, we recognize that there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, there's a comprehensive effort involving engineering, enforcement, education, communications, and public health with a focus on areas such as roadway design, pedestrian and cyclist safety, young drivers, distracted and aggressive driving. Um, so a number of things that, that I do wanna highlight here um, related to our road safety and vision zero strategy. Um, I guess really one key thing I wanna to touch on first is um, in 2017, council adopted um, Vision Zero principles. Um, Vision Zero is a global movement to end traffic related fatalities and serious injuries. So council making that commitment, um, you know, to, to get on board with that and to really show that, you know, they, they agree with those principles is, you know, was really a big step for us. Um, and even before that, there's a lot of things that we were doing. Um, we had a school zone speed reduction policy implemented in 2015. Um, we also have red light camera program. We have 10 red light cameras in the city. Uh, we have uh, about 174 pedestrian crossovers and we're putting in another 21 this year. Um, we've also been reducing the area speed limits um, to 40 kilometers in neighborhoods. We've got about 50% of that done right now. And we also have the automated speed enforcement uh, program, which is up and running. Um, so that was just to highlight some of the programs. Um, we also have uh, speed display boards that we, we rotate around the city as an educational tour, tool to make drivers more aware of how fast they're driving. And we also have a respect the limit campaign, which was introduced. Um, we're also constructing narrow lane, narrower lanes to encourage slower speeds um, and leading pedestrian cycling intervals at traffic signals. So. Um, yeah, we, we have been working hard, but yeah, we certainly acknowledge that there, there's more work to do and we're, we're committed to doing that. We're continually reviewing, um, you know, what others are doing, um, best practices and, and really developing our own. Okay, so the pers personal safety, racism and discrimination, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important topic and the mobility master plan is utilizing research from the safe city scoping study. Um, some of the stats to highlight uh, are that one in three Londoners who are women will experience sexual violence. Um, also, we know that women, girls, non-binary and trans individuals and survivors most often experience sexual violence in public spaces, including while moving around the city. Transit safety was identified as an issue about 50% of all research focused on 2SL GBTQ plus individuals. Uh, this really can be broken down to three areas, safety in transit, safety while getting to transit, and safety impacted by lack of transit. Uh, there's a lot of other stats I, I, I could get into. Um, I guess a, a couple more. Um, Four out of six immigrants and visible minorities reported experiencing discrimination in London Middlesex in the past three years. Um, for Indigenous peoples, it was six out of 10. So there's a lot of stats and research out there to, to show that this is a real issue that we wanna address. And we are hearing it from the community too. So it's something that we take very importantly and um, we'll be considering as part of this plan. Physical and mental health. Um, being physical, physically active at any age has many physical and mental health benefits, um, such as lowering the risk of several chronic diseases, um, 
obesity, reduce stress and improve mental health. Yet we know that Canadians are not getting enough physical activity. Only 49% of adults and 44% of children and youth in Canada get the recommended level of physical activity. Um, as part of the new mobility master plan, uh, we can help the physical activity in a daily life by making it easier um, to engage in active travel. So there's a, a number of things we can do to make that happen. Um, certainly making walking and cycling more attractive by improving our sidewalks and cycling facilities, um, making transit more attractive by making it easier um, and more efficient. Um, wayfinding signs, make it easier to navigate to nearby destinations and connections. Um, and making walking, cycling and other forms of mobility um, more attractive by improving lighting and accessible seating and, and um, planting. So that's just a, a list of some of the things um, that we're, we'd like to work on. Access to everyday needs. And I'm, I'm glad that this came up in the, the Q&A earlier because we've had a real focus on this. It's not just like where you can get to and how you're gonna get there, but what is that really giving you access to? Um, the London policy is that we plan for development, so use, intensity, and form that is conducive to efficient operation and increased usage of public transit, walking, and cycling. Um, what this means is that we want to create and enhance walkable neighborhoods by supporting connections to transit and other neighborhood amenities within a 10 minute walk. So neighborhood amenities, that's, that's your everyday needs, that's getting to schools, uh, grocery stores, uh, medical centers, jobs. Um, so part of that is, is planning and developing a uh, high concentration of everyday needs in areas with the greatest transportation and mobility options. Um, so it's really uh, giving you better access to areas that have more of your everyday needs very close together. Um, and also it's filling in gaps in connectivity um, in neighborhoods um, and to and from neighborhoods. So again, um, takes us back to the, the cycling facilities and, and sidewalks. Um, and transit services as well. Okay, great, my mic is on. Um, thanks, Sarah. So uh, this is a very important reflection point. So even though we're a little bit shorter, shorter on time, we're gonna engage with it. I'm not gonna skip over it um, because it's really important to know for everyone who is here, when you moved to London or when you moved to wherever you currently live in London, what would you say were some of the top three things that impacted your decision? We want you to drop that in the chat and um, let us know what, what did you want to be close to? What did you want around you? What did you need to have access to and how did you need to have access to it? Like I can answer this question myself that one of the one of the main factors that impacted why I live in the current place that I live in is that I wanted to have uh, pedestrian access to the city's main center. So, um, and I'm seeing some people kind of echo that accessibility without a car. Um, having a walkable neighborhood uh, needs to be emphasized in places that are not in the city center. Definitely agree. So being able to walk to the grocery store, I'm sure those of you who have children um, also think about that walkability and, and sidewalks and the presence of roads and bike lanes, um, as well as safety in a mobility sense of what is around you. So I'm seeing some parents saying that in the chat. Nature, I love that one. Um, and also proximity to grocery stores, proximity to work. Kids can walk to school. Um, someone in here is a student, so they wanted to be able to walk to school. To their school that all makes complete sense so walkability is a big one and that and that also explains why many people were talking about sidewalks in the chat so thank you um thank you for informing yourself and informing us yeah so excellent um now i'm going to hand it back to sarah to give us the context great thanks sarah um, yeah, so moving to the context. Um, so a lot of what we've talked about so far is the feedback we've heard and, uh, you know, where the, the current status of things are in London. Um, we're just going to touch on the context quickly just to kind of, you know, reconfirm like why is, why is this plan needed now? Um, and we'll jump into it. Um, so for starters, 
we've got rapid population growth in the city. Um, in 2021, the city population was um, a little over 437,000. Um, and in 2051, the population estimated to grow to about 623,000. That is a 42% increase in our population. That's, that's huge. I mean, we've been growing fast and, and we're gonna continue to grow even faster. And in all that additional growth means more people going places. So, you know, it really emphasizes our need to improve our transportation mobility system to better serve our existing population, but also the significant growth expected. Um, COVID impacts and recovery. So from an economic perspective, London has recovered well. Uh, we've replaced the, the jobs we lost in war. Um, but from a social perspective, socially there, there's still a lot of issues. Um, being able to access those jobs is still very challenging to many. Um, right now, the, the women's participation in the workforce is at a 30 year low. Um, Sometimes uh, that's related to challenges with, with getting to and accessing childcare, or maybe it's uh, care for someone elderly. There are also many Londoners, Londoners that need to get work set work outside of um, where transit services are offered, offered or where transit, transit services won't get them to um, as early as they need to get there. Um, so we're also seeing that on the other side, employers facing challenges getting workers. Um, and it's, it's really forcing them to delay or refuse new orders, providing further challenges to, to our um, post-pandemic recovery. Crisis, they have been going up like crazy. So in addition to labor challenges and the barriers some people you know, are facing in, in getting and keeping work, rising prices are impacting people as well. Um, based on Stats Canada, the, the numbers up on the screen here for the average um, household expenses in, in 2019. Um, so at that time, um, the average after-tax income of a 25 to 34-year-old was only 43,500. Now, I say only because when you compare that to just the cost of shelter and food alone, that's, you know, it's almost 33,000. That, that's like a, a significant chunk of, of that after-tax income. Um, going a step further, 25% of the people in that same um, age group made less than 26,000. So, I mean, I think it's very evident, like, why many people are struggling. Um, and these are 2019 numbers. That's what Stats Canada has available right now. Um, but also, on top of that, prices are continuing to go up more. In June, the annual rate of inflation peaked um, at 7.9%. That's the highest it's been in 30 years. And wage increase is not going up at that same rate. So more than ever, we need to make moving around the city more affordable. Looking at those numbers on the previous screen, I, I think you can really start to understand what a struggle it can be for a lot of people to afford their everyday needs and, and what a real risk to becoming homeless is. Um, if you are someone experiencing or at risk of experience homelessness, please call 661-HOME. You know, we had the opportunity to chat with some of our, our staff um, last week who, who work in this department. And, you know, there, there is a lot of tough stories about people's struggles out there today, but there are also some really good stories of, you know, staff helping prevent people from being homeless. So uh, I really encourage you to call that. Um, again, if you're experienced or at risk of experience homeless, because um, th there are some things that, that you staff really can do to help. Um, also, um, last fall, Mayor Ed Holder, with the support of council, directed staff to develop 3,000 affordable housing units in five years. So that's something that's happening as well. Um, now, as part of the mobility master plan, um, what we can do was help with some of those next steps, uh, making it easier for people to access their everyday needs. So get to work, um, you know, having buses be efficient and, and quick enough to, to get them to drop off their child to, to daycare and get to their job, things like that. As the mayor stated, London's most vulnerable don't choose their circumstances. They are where they are, largely due to a lack of choice. Um, and again, this project's really about providing more choices and options for people. Yes, so um, really, really important section of the presentation. Some really important points um, and, and things brought up that should really make you think and um, feel some cause for concern. Of course, we don't want to alarm anybody um, but it is really important to know because coming from a community standpoint that quote that was 
on the slide earlier was a little bit heartbreaking. You know, if somebody um, has to choose between a bus pass or groceries, and it should never, we should never be in a situation like that. Um, but the reality is that many Londoners are. So uh, on the screen, you will see one of the main five guiding principles that were proposed by the Mobility Master Plan, and that is ensuring that mobility and its infrastructure is affordable for current and future generations. Um, we've seen how high gas prices is really changing how people are getting around. Um, sometimes people have the choice to think about that, but other times it really is not feasible. Um, and we've also heard about how different age groups, uh, especially students and youth, have to make life changes after they're finished school. Some of them no longer have a transit pass and may not be able to afford to get one um, on their um, salary or on their income. We've also heard from people who are living off of pensions or government assistance who have a hard time, especially in the current moment after, you know, two years of a pandemic and the inflation um, that is not being, you know, offset by rising income costs or rising income. Uh, and so a lot of people are not able to get out of the house. You know, this is not an acceptable situation really anywhere. Um, and in a city that is growing so much in numbers, ideally will be growing in culture and will be growing in quality of life. We have to make sure that that growth is being seen across the landscape, being done in an equitable way. Um, and, you know, really does not discriminate about race, income, age group, um, orientation, etc. We've heard uh, from parents of high school age kids who are trying to get their first job, but there's a burden of paying for transportation. Um, and of course, we've also heard about transfer times not being long enough for people who are riding the bus and need longer than an hour um, or an hour and a half to transfer. Sometimes they have to take multiple buses to get from place to place. They need to walk between stops. There's time and um, there's money involved in that. So now more than ever, you know, we could keep going on this list and on, on and on as to why these reasons um, or what reasons there are that are contributing to affordability being a major cause of importance in the mobility, mobility master plan. But more than anything, it's just suffices to say that we need affordable transportation for all Londoners and that that is a right. Okay, Sarah, back to you um, to get in these last couple of minutes so that we can speak with our panel of experts who have been waiting so patiently. Um, let's go. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we already did touch on uh, racism and um, when we were talking about personal safety a bit, and there's a lot of stats that, you know, I referenced that and, and studies that really, you know, make it undeniable that this is a real issue. Um, so, and, and when those equity deserving groups feel unsafe, they're, they're excluded from social, economic, and the health benefits that are available to, to others that are more safe traveling around. Um, studies have shown actually that many equity deserving groups are underserved. Um, so that, and that relates to say sidewalks, cycling facilities, transit, kind of everything, uh, all of the above. Um, this is something that we will be reviewing um, and acting on as part of this project. Uh, one of the ways we're going to do that is all the plans and policies developed as part of this project will be delivered um, through and looked at through the equity lens and will follow the anti-racism and anti-oppression framework recently developed by the city. Um, so climate change, uh, one of the things we really need to do is take a more balanced approach at how we plan and prioritize infrastructure for the various modes, uh, not only from an equity perspective, but also from an environmental one. Um, as hopefully many people know, uh, City Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. Um, and consistent with the council approved climate emergency action plan, we are working towards a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. Well, why is this important for this plan? Well, in particular, because personal vehicles are actually responsible for about one third of our local greenhouse gas emissions. Um, all transportation activities account for 45% of them. Um, just to touch on some of the, the goals of the Climate Emergency Action Plan or SEEP as we like to call it. Um, one of the goals is to have few, 40 fewer in town, sorry, 40% fewer in town trips by vehicle um, by 2030. 
and electrifying the LTC bus fleet by 2025, sorry, 2030. 25% by 2030, my apologies. So um, as I did mention earlier, we, we are making steps towards meeting that goal. Okay, next steps. Um, I'll just quickly go into the next steps for the projects. So you get a, a bit of an understanding of how all this feedback we, we've been collecting is gonna inform um, the project. So right now we're here, we're in phase one, um, which was uh, you know, gathering a lot of feedback from the community as well as doing a lot of technical analysis behind the scenes to, to gain a better understanding of the, the system we have. And, and we're still doing that work as well. Um, then we're gonna be moving into phase two. We wanna continue to get feedback from the community. Um, and we're gonna be using all the feedback we, we've got and we'll continue to get to help develop different um, options for how we're gonna meet meet the goals that, that we're setting up for this plan. Um, and then the last phase will be confirming the path forward and, and the plan for the implementation of it. So um, we are in the early phase of the project. So there is lots of time to give feedback and, and we really do want and encourage it. Um, and we're gonna to continue to keep you involved as, as we develop options for, for meeting those goals. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to everybody, um, again, who has been here for the entire duration of the presentation, for waiting patiently, and definitely thank you so much to the um, experts who have been here since the beginning. So now um, we're going to start with the Q&A session. Um, we've, we've received a lot of very, very thought-provoking questions in the chat. Um, those of you who have attended today's uh, uh, webinar um, or meeting or live stream, this is a mix of a lot of different things, you're clearly very informed as to um, what's going on and, and you have a clear idea of what you would like to see in the city. So again, um, thank you. And we just want to acknowledge that and definitely say that for those who are tuning in after the fact. So um, I'm gonna introduce our panel. We have 10 people <laughs> um, who can speak to a lot of your questions and a lot of points that have been brought up here. So um, this is a very active panel here and a very um, illustrious one. So I'm just going to read, I'm gonna um, introduce everybody and, and what they do. So please bear with me. Again, we're lucky to have so many um, important people from our community here with us tonight. Um, so to start, uh, we have Doug McRae who is the Director of Transportation and Mobility in London. So there we go, we can see Doug. Hello, Doug. <laughs> um, we've got Jay Stanford, who is the Director of Climate Change, Environment and Waste Management in London. There you are, Jay, hello. Yeah, it's great to just see you wave, see you smile, uh, give a nod. Melanie Stone, who is the Accessibility and Inclusion Advisor um, we also have Justin Adima, the manager at Long Range Planning and Research. John Kemp of the IBI Group, which were the partner, the research partners on this project. Um, Stephanie Wilson, a landscape architect and who works at Parks uh, in London. She's a Parks planner. Uh, we have Katie Burns, the director of planning at the LTC, the London Transit Commission. Rhonda Britton who is from the Middlesex London Health Unit, uh, and she's the manager of Healthy Communities and Injury Prevention. And of course, Sarah Grady, uh, who is an engineer at the Traffic and Transportation Office. Um, we also have Veronica Antipolo, who provided the um, story who, that set us off at the beginning of the stream tonight. So welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Again, thank you for your patience and uh, we look forward to discussing some of these questions with you. Um, so here we go. Um, I'm going to be directing some questions that we received towards certain different members of the panel tonight. So um, the first question goes to Doug and it is, who is going to pay for London's new mobility master plan? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Okay, pay. Yes, that's a very uh, relevant question and uh, something we're very cognizant of, recognizing that uh, one of our five guiding draft writing principles is uh, to be financially sustainable. So uh, I guess there's two aspects to who pays. And 
One is, uh, you know, that the capital costs, so the cost of construction, and uh, and then the other is operating, so things like uh, transit and winter road maintenance, and the MMP will, I guess, have the potential to create new programs. It, it might also reprioritize existing spending so that we can route it uh, uh, better based on uh, what we learn out of the study. So the capital side, the construction side, that's typically funded by uh, the tax rate, so property taxes, and also development charges. So the money that developers uh, put in uh, and contribute as they build uh, and develop in the city. And then the, th the third contributor to the construction projects is often uh, the provincial and federal governments who have recently had programs uh, very focused around public transit and active transportation. And then on the operating side, uh, a lot of the like winter road maintenance, for example, and uh, maintaining sidewalks and roads that's primarily funded out of the uh, out of the, the city's tax rate. And uh, but then there's also for programs like transit, there's also senior government funding that uh, that contributes. So all of those different sources will uh, will hopefully be there in the future and uh, and managed by the city to uh, help help fund uh, the recommendations that come out of the plan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, so. Uh, Again, that was a very important question and one that it makes sense a lot of people were asking. Um, the next question we received via email, and uh, this goes towards Jay, I believe, um, and it is, why are we building so many bike lanes? Um, why are we building so many bike lanes? Well, we're actually uh, probably have a bike lane deficit, and I think we've heard loud and clear from uh, many on the call tonight about the improvements they want to see. We have been hearing those same comments for a number of years, and I do hope people are recognizing the improvements that have occurred in the last couple of years, but I'm going to actually pass this over to uh, my colleague here, Daniel Hall, uh, who probably hears firsthand about this every day. Dan, how about uh, some comments from you? Jay, I like what you said about deficit. Um, there's a there's this pent up demand in the community that we want to bike more. We would bike more if we felt safer, and so that's the the real heart of the issue. We we saw the map that showed um, some of the gaps in the current system, and so we're trying to close those gaps, trying to offer people a comfortable choice when they cycle. Thank you, Daniel. Um, certainly from a climate perspective, as well as a logistics perspective, this is a very necessary question and with over half, and I think the majority of the people who are here tonight using bikes uh, and using their bikes frequently, as you indicated in the polls, uh, we knew that question was certainly coming. So next question is for Sarah, and uh, this can, I think, be a great opportunity to put this all of this incredible information into um, a roadmap. So this person is wondering, how do we know that the transportation and mobility infrastructure programs and policies for the next 25 years, very future thinking, are equitable, healthy, safe, integrated, connected, and efficient? Uh, what are the targets and who sets them and how are they measured? Great question. And I feel like there's, I could talk for a long time answering that, but I won't do that because you've already heard me talk a lot. But um, I think a lot of things you heard there um, really are, are included within our guiding principles. So um, as we move forward with developing this project, um, you know, I think it's hopefully we've made it clear that those are very important to us and we need to develop the metrics to be measuring those to make sure that we are meeting the, those goals. So we haven't got to that step yet. Um, but yeah, everything you listed off there really is really important. And, and, and that's how we're going to be um, using that criteria to develop the options and, and how we evaluate which ones are, are the preferred. Thank you, Sarah. So um, there's another question that I'm going to uh, ask you uh, and then also let you encourage you if you need to hand that over to uh, somebody like Katie, please do. So how does London plan to improve its transit service in the coming years 
to make it more consistent, reliable, and affordable? Kind of similar to the question you just answered, but um, a little bit more focused. Um, yeah, so I think that was specifically about transit there, if I'm not right. Um, we did touch, hopefully, on, on a lot of things today and a lot of the improvements we are making um, to, to meet that and to do that, to make it more efficient and reliable. And uh, really, I think we have to be proactively planning for growth too. Like I said, it's not only about, you know, meeting the needs of, of people today, but um, how our city grows. So it's uh, proactively putting in that, that infrastructure from the beginning um, to accommodate that. So um, maybe, maybe I'll pass it off to, to Katie to elaborate a bit more on that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we currently have a five-year plan that is approved until 2024 um, that it, we're using as a framework to improve transit across the system. Um, and many of those things, um, like Sarah mentioned, we do have the approved um, 2021 and 2022 service plans. Unfortunately, due to ongoing resource shortages, those Im uh, implementation dates have been postponed um, and there isn't a uh, time frame at this point for the implementation. Um, we do hope to have them all implemented by the end of 2023, but the individual implementation um, dates are not known at this point. Um, we, as Sarah also mentioned, um, part of our goals are to an enhance the express route network. Um, we will be having the um, rapid transit coming online, which we are currently building, um, and also looking at um, th important things such as eliminating 60 minute frequencies. Um, we have heard from a number of people that 60 minute frequencies just aren't adequate for being able to get to places where they need to go. So that is one of the things that's actually approved as part of the 2021 service plan. Um, and we hope to be implementing that um, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Katie. So um, we have time for two more questions. And uh, again, just want to say sorry that we haven't had a chance to answer all of them. Um, you can definitely email questions that have been unasked and we will also be um, following up with some of the unasked but very important questions tonight um, on the page that we'll be posting the replay of this. So this question goes to Justin. Uh, what are the city's plans to stop urban sprawling? And maybe you want to explain what urban sprawl is briefly. Thanks, Sarah, for the question. Um, it, it is a, an important one and, and a challenge that we deal with as we we manage the growth of the city um, so urban sprawl is i think a, a, in general referencing low density outward expansion of the city and accommodating the growth of the city through um, outward growth instead of inward and upward growth or intensification within the built-up area um, so in the london plan which is our new official plan we've adopted um, a number of policies that support um, that inward and upward intensification. Uh, we have a target of at least 45% of new units um, created in the city to be within the existing built up area. And through the London plan, we've created a number of policies that um, that support more intense forms of development uh, across all place types within the city. So intensification and, and that high density growth is focused in key areas that support transit, such as downtown and our new transit village place types. Um, but really all throughout the city, we've created a new policy um, approach that, that considers more intensity um, while also trying to balance that with um, context sensitive development. Uh, we're working on a new zoning bylaw right now that will um, hopefully implement um, some of those objectives in the not too distant future. Um, so that would be kind of the, the number one tool that we use to implement and, and help to realize those policy objectives that are in the London plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as of course, um, thank you very much uh, for answering that. Um, Justin, of course, anything that involves the city requires context be a major part of that um, consideration. You know, context is everything. Uh, so the last question I would like for both Sarah and Melody to comment on. Um, so first, Sarah, this is directly to you. What are the next steps that um, what are the, the next steps regarding the immediate changes 
that Londoners can expect to see to improve mobility? Yeah, great question. I know when we talk about planning for 2050, it seems quite far away, but um, even as we're working on this plan, there, there's a number of improvements we're working on, um, including like the, the rapid transit improvements. Um, we're also continuing to build uh, more, more bike lanes and more bike infrastructure based on um, the, the cycling master plan, which is ultimately going to be integrated with this plan. And we're continuing to build sidewalks. So um, I you know, hopefully, you know, people did take away some of the things we're currently working on. Um, but for this project, it's not just planning for 2050. There's a lot of things that we're going to be implementing out of this plan right away. Uh, we are going to be looking for quick wins, if you will, like th those projects that have like significant um, upfront um, impacts and, and really help people out. But because um, some things aren't, aren't, it's not just about dollars. There's things that we can do that make really big changes um, and, and are quicker and easier to implement. So yeah, we're certainly going to be looking at um, projects and make uh, significant changes to help people move around um, right off the get go. Um, and then continuing to, to work on that progress right up to 2050. Um, Melanie, um, maybe you want to touch on some of the, the stuff that you're working on as part of your plan as well. Absolutely. So uh, as part of the accessibility plan, we're also looking at making those important connections to the master mobility plan. I heard a lot of feedback from folks um, with living with Alzheimer's, folks living uh, with intellectual disability labels, folks who lived with different mobility challenges. We really did a lot of outreach in that uh, in that regard, hearing from people about how they move around the city and wanting to see more representation in images of the city in cyclists. So for example, the, the idea that people with disabilities don't use um, bicycles is, is absolutely not true. Many people with disabilities want to see themselves represented in the literature that we put out, in the images that we put out about cyclists in the different size bicycles that people use. Um, so looking to sort of bridge uh, the accessibility and inclusion piece and the work of the anti-racism and anti-oppression office was sort of some of that big information piece around educating the community that there is different ways to move about the city and different ways that we can all feel that impact uh, when we're well represented by those images um, and, and by um, those folks who are working on the plan. And so uh, this has been a really interesting a connection to make and really one that I see the, the accessibility plan speaking to the, mass, the mobility master plan in a meaningful way. Uh, so that's what we're hoping to do next. Thank you so much, Melanie. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to end the Q&A session on that point, because really what this is all about is formulating and implementing a successful mobility plan for all. So it's it's really great to hear you say that you know, what, what is being done in terms of understanding how to make London more accessible, how to make it more equitable, how to make it a more um, uh, accepting place of people from all backgrounds is speaking to this effort that is also making it a more mobile place for people of all backgrounds, abilities, um, socioeconomic status, ages, what have you. So uh, as we approach wrapping up this um, tonight's session, it's important to say that we want to keep the conversation going. The city is dedicated to hearing from as many Londoners as possible um, in the formulation of this plan and in its successful execution. So please share this information with your friends and family. Those of you who are here tonight, it's very clear that um, we can rely on you to do that. And we're just speaking for myself personally, very, very grateful and very humbled that you would do so. So giving, um, giving thanks for that. Please get people involved. Um, speak to your friends and family, let them know why this is important, why it matters. And especially for any information that resonated with you tonight, whether it was something that you learned, a statistic, something that um, you're looking forward to, seeing done in the city, whatever it was, um, or if there are further considerations that you think we need to make, further challenges, spread the word co-host a community meeting with the city, uh, get in contact via phone. You, there's a phone number there um, that you can call or email mmp at london.ca anytime. You know, this is um, one of the things that we have available to us is, is engagement and the ability to have your voice heard, especially from uh, coming from a city body that wants to hear your voice. You know, this is something to not take for granted and we know that you won't. Um, you can also request a copy of the feedback form 
to print and share within your network. You can give your feedback directly to the city on this plan uh, and on your concerns. We know that you have a lot, a lot of information to share. And um, I know I'm speaking for everybody here on the panel tonight and your information is what empowers uh, those who are in place to make a decision to make these changes. Your information, your knowledge empowers them to make a more informed choice, um, especially ones that speak to those of Londoners. So again, you'll see that phone number and that email. Um, if we could drop that in the chat, it's already dropped. Excellent. Um, also, let us know how you felt about today's Zoom, Zoom webinar. Um, anything from the format to the accessibility to the content that was discussed. Uh, let us know how the city can do its absolute best. Um, we definitely want to know that. So um, as we close and take this to the very end, we want to say thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time. We know that life is busy and it's not always to make time. It's not always easy to make time to come to these um, these kinds of online events to come and give your feedback, to think these things through, to engage. But we sincerely thank you um, for taking the time to do that tonight. Um, and once again, just if for those who are not able to be here um, and if, this, if these are people in your network, please uh, encourage them to visit getinvolved.london.ca to continue the conversation, to find opportunities to engage with the city, and most importantly, to have your voice heard because making your, making your voice heard is, is how um, change happens. So um, once again, in closing, um, a final thank you, but also uh, to end this in the same spirit in which we started it, I would like to remind everyone that tomorrow, September 30th, is an incredibly important day, not just for Londoners, but for all of us who live in Canada, who call ourselves Canadians. It is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, so on September 30th, which again is tomorrow, Canadians are encouraged to come together to honour and remember the many Indigenous children stolen from their families and forced to attend residential schools by wearing the colour orange. The Namarind Friendship Centre will unveil We Are Still Here, which is a seven panel mural that will honour residential school survivors, the children who were lost in the system, their families and their communities. And this will take place at 2 p.m. if you are interested in attending. So it's, um, again, speaking on accessibility, mobility, and community in general, um, we have to stay also in connection with one another and in understanding of what our responsibilities are as those who live on this land, who move around in this land, uh, and you know it wouldn't be possible without our indigenous brothers and sisters having been the stewards of this land for so long. So um, that needs to be said. Uh, especially before closing out this, this session. Also, um, want to thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. Again, apologies to those of you who didn't get a chance to answer questions um, or to speak. I'm sure that you understand why <laughs> the presentation was extremely, extremely informative. So thank you so much, Sarah, for leading us through that in um, a very, very understandable and accessible way. Thank you very much to um, all the consultants, the engineers, the researchers who contributed to putting this presentation together. Um, very big thank you to Megan, uh, who works at the City of London Communications Department, who worked tirelessly to put all of this together and uh, who was incredibly, incredibly lovely to work with. Big thank you to Veronica, who organized um, this whole live stream. So not only would, did she come up with a very creative and um, beautiful concept, to put the community stories into an understandable uh, piece of poetry, but she also put this live stream together and built this infrastructure and got everybody prepped and ready to go. So thank you very much, Veronica. Um, and thank you to all, once again, the councillors and the elected officials who are here, who have been lending their ears and uh, who I'm sure have some very important pieces of information to take away. Um, 
And big, big shout out to um, the audience tonight because uh, your participation, your input, your knowledge uh, really shows why this work is extremely important and necessary in the city. And um, it's very timely as well. So again, thank you very much for being here and for engaging. Um, glad to hear that it was informative and uh, how um, you enjoyed being a part of these sessions and um, seeing some feedback in there that more sessions like this are needed. So that is, is excellent. Uh, you know, I think coming from these kinds of initiatives from the city, it's important to know that people want more of it. And why wouldn't you, right? Why wouldn't you want to say in what goes on in your immediate environments, especially if you're able to impact it for the better for yourself and for your neighbors, because that's what community really does. That's the purpose of it. So again, just want to say a big thanks to everybody who was involved, whether as an organizer, a participant, a speaker. Um, and from my behalf, uh, it's been really a great opportunity and a great experience to sit here and um, chat with everyone and be able to take us through this presentation. So thank you very much um, for having me on here and for just sharing in this experience with all of us. So as you know, um, a, a, a native Londoner, because I, def I grew up in London, um, born in Ottawa, but grew up in London, can definitely say that this is a nice full circle moment. And um, I look forward to seeing more of these communications, more of these talks, and um, for sure, the improvements and growth that London will inevitably experience, we are here for it. <laughs> so my name is Zara Habib. Um, it has been a wonderful evening. I hope to stay in connection with as many people here as possible, and we will see you at the next chat. So until then, stay safe, keep biking, walking, taking the bus, driving in your car, whatever it is that gets you through, um, keep doing it. And of course, um, do your absolute best to stay safe and keep those around you safe. And we will see you at the next one. Thanks very much, everybody.